Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 6, Halakha 2. Today we're getting into what happens when a vineyard is planted on sloping ground. In the art scroll, we're on 56A1. The mission is going to be broken up into two parts. The first part of the mission is going to be talking about the aris. Again, that's going to be the vines that are planted on the wall. And the second part is going to be a regular vineyard. That's going to be where the vines are on the ground and on this embankment. The Mishnah starts off and it says regarding the aris, this is this trellised vineyard. And again, it is up on a wall or a trellis. And it's going to protrude from an embankment. That's what the Mishnah says. Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov says that if one is able to stand on the low ground alongside the embankment and harvest all of the fruit of the vineyard, then the vineyard prohibits four amos in the lower field for planting with foreign seed. Now, what does that mean? Now, you have an embankment and you have on the side of this embankment at the top part of the embankment, a wall, and somebody put on this trellis the vines. The vines are now hanging over, and basically the wall is going to be at the highest part of the embankment, and you're standing below it, and the trellis is going to be up overhead. And what it's saying is that if you're able to stand on the ground and pick all the fruit from this trellis above your head, then if you want to plant foreign seed, you have to take the edge of where the vine is on this trellis, and you have to measure out four amos, and then you can plant a new field over there. You can plant new species. So what this is saying is they're saying, look, the the wall is higher, and this is saying that the really what this is trying to describe is maybe... This, these vines that are on top of this trellis that are overhanging this embankment that are above your head, that this is really like being treated like a vineyard. And the edge of these vines that are pretty far away from this top part of the wall, this top part of the embankment that are really hanging over, it's really going to be treated like a vineyard. You're going to have to set it back for almost. Now, the the question that's going to be coming up later is this all might not really be uh, Bet Hillel. This is actually could be Bet Shammai's opinion. So keep that in mind. Now, Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov is going to continue on what might be a Bet Shammai and say, but if one is not able to reach all of the grapes while standing in the lower field, the vineyard is going to prohibit only that which is directly opposite and below it. So if the aris is planted on this elevated area and the branches are growing outward into the air over the lower field. And now you're standing at the bottom part of this sloped embankment and you're trying to reach up. And the mission is saying that if the harvester is standing standing without getting onto a stool or climbing up on the embankment, then this area underneath the overhead is going to get the stringency just like it would be on the upper area on the side of the wall, next to the wall in the upper part. But if one would want to uh, look at the next part of it, the question is that if you're unable to get it, then then what's going to happen? Well, the idea is that the area beneath the vines would not be treated as the primary place of planting, and it's not going to prohibit the four almost around it. In other words, these vines are on this trellis, and they're way too high for you to do without a ladder. Basically, what this is trying to do is say that this is broken up so that while these vines are overhead, if it's too high to reach, you can never plant underneath the trellis, but you don't have a four ama setback. In other words, right at the edge of where the branches are, you can start planting a new field. But the idea is that these branches that are on the trellis, and okay, you know, you can't reach the grapes, they're high up, there's even an embankment there, and you're on the lower ground. Can you plant right underneath those grapevines? You cannot. It's going to be a climb problem. But it's going to be a case where, look, this is like treated like a different area of planting. 
And that's why you're not going to need a four ama setback. Now, the Mishnah goes on to another law, not collect, connected now to the Aris, but when you're planting vines on an embankment, and if you drive around the Jerusalem hills, you will see a lot of hilly ground, and a lot of the uh, vineyards are, are planted alongside hills. So this is actually very relevant. Rabbi Lazar in this Mishnah says that also if one plants one row of vines on the ground, and one row on an embankment, this is the law. And this is going to be the body of the Malokit in this Gemara. It says, if it is ten tefachim higher than the ground, the upper row does not combine with the lower row to form the vineyard. But if it is not ten tefachim higher than the ground, the upper row does combine with the lower row to form a vineyard. The question is, what is the word it? Does that mean that the embankment is going to be ten tefachim? Uh, you're going to measure off 10 tefahim from the slope of the embankment? Or does it mean that one layer of vines, one row of vines, is going to be 10 tefahim higher than the second row of vines? It's unclear which it it is talking about. And we're going to get into the differences and those laws. Now, the Gemara is going to start about the Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov part, talking about the aris on this embankment and the slope. And again, you know, we're worried about what happens where you're looking at this main part of the planting area, and again, without a ladder, just standing there by yourself without a stool or a ladder, can you reach these vines and grapes overhead and pick them or not? So the Gemara says that Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, who says in the name of Rabbi Lazar Ben Yaakov, this is who the Mishnah is uh, talking about, says that if one raises his vineyard to less than a tefach from the ground and the vines regrow, the vines are subject to orla because their exception, the exemption would create the appearance of wrongdoing. But the opinion of the sages is that he is not obligated to treat the fruit of the new vines as orla until he raises the old ones down to the ground. So what we're doing is we are teaching three sets of of new laws that we didn't talk about before, but these are all connected to the same Tana. That's why these are all grouped in here like this. The law of Orla, just to recap, is going to be where the fruit in the tree for the first three years after it's planted, you can't use it. But the new vines, in this case, are coming from a stump, and this is a stump of an old tree. So the, as long as part of the old vine, even less than a tefach, is left above the surface of the ground, anything that's going to sprout from it is going to be allowed. Why? Because it's going to be, it's not totally raised, it's not totally destroyed. You already did orla on this grapevine. You cut it down, the grapevine is going to be a tefach or more above the ground, and a new branch grew out of it. And sometimes you will see that where they try to cut down trees and then, you know, a new sapling will grow out of the tree. According to the sages, the rabbis are not worried about the possibility of the fruit of the new vines being identified as orla. And so they didn't issue a decree. So as long as part of the old vine, even less than a tefach, is left above the ground, anything that sprouts above it or from it is permitted. But the condition the sages say is that if the vines are raised all the way down to the ground where you've shown everybody that you clearly have nullified these vines and destroyed them, then anything that is going to grow out of this is not going to be a shoot of the old vine. It's going to be regarded as a new planting in its own right. And then you would have to go through Orla again. And this, by the way, is going to be actual Orla de Raita, not Orla de Rabbanon. Now, the nuance here is that in the case that we're talking about with this other Tana, where he's saying that if you raise the vineyard to less than a tefach from the ground and then the vines regrow, the vines are subject to Orla, the, this is going to be a Darabinan thing. Why? Because he's saying that it's the appearance of wrongdoing. And the sages are saying, look, if you cut this to less than a tefach from the ground, they're both agreeing that if it's less than a tefach, if it's even like been cut to the ground itself, that there's that it's a question is, is this going to be Orla Deraita or Darabanan? 
And the sages are actually going to be saying that it's actually going to be Orla Doraita, not Dorabanan. The second ruling. So it goes like this. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman says to the name in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, who says in the name of this Tana, Rabbi Lazar Ben Yaakov, who also is the Tana in this Mishnah, and says that if a poor person makes a finished pile of produce from Leket, Shkikika, and Peya that he gathered up, the produce is subject to Truma Gadola because its exemption would create the appearance of wrongdoing. A lot going on here. So Leket, Shkikika, and Peya are gifts that are guaranteed to the poor. And these are when you are harvesting the field. You're not supposed to finish off the corner of the field. Leket is going to be where some of the grain is dropped. And Shkikika is going to be, are there going to be sheaves that were collected and forgotten? And the question here is, what happens when the poor person comes and he takes it? But then he goes to the next step. It's like he has the farm itself. And he's actually heaped it up and he's actually gathered it together. And he's actually like he's finished it. There, he's saying that he has to do Truma Gadola, not to Raita, but to Rabbanan. And why is that? Again, the appearance of wrongdoing. Now, the Gemara is only mentioning Truma Gadola, and that is singled out because it's the first of the tithes and it's generally taken in the field from the pile. That's the insight by the Panay Moshe. And, you know, once the grain is processed, it's subject to truma and the other ties, but this processing is considered to be done when the grain is made into a pile, and then the pile is smooth. And by biblical law, leket, shkikah, and peya are not subject to any ties. So what he's saying is, this Tana is saying that, wait a second, that there's a derabanan thing here, because it might be the appearance of wrongdoing. Except that we know from Maseket Peya that these are, these are gifts to the poor that are not subject to any tithing obligations whatsoever. So the exclusion of Leket, Shkikir, and Peya from the tithes is known from the verse, actually, Duraita that's discussing Maeser Rishon, where it says over in Devarim 1429, it says, and the, the Levite shall come uh, for he shares no portion or inheritance with you. And we infer from this that uh, which portion does a Levite not share? He doesn't get Lechet, Shkikah, and Peya. So it's meaning that it is exempt from tithes. That's how they're they're reading it. Now, the Rambam is going to be interpreting it like this in Hilchos Trumos, that it is widely known that the pile that is going to be Lechet, Shkikah, and Peya, and it's going to be widely known like which is which, because people are going to see him be bringing in these parts from the field bit by bit. And so... The Rambam is saying that this cre decree does not apply. In other words, that they're saying that this is a Durabanan thing, and the sages clearly are not agreeing with that. They're saying that it's always going to be exempt from tithes, and it's very nice that they've created a pile, but the neighbors saw him do it as a pauper, right? He's going and picking through uh, sheaves of grain that were left, or he's picking through uh, ears that fell as they were being gathered. And he, he only go, goes and adds them up in small pieces. So it's clear that these are going to be Doraita Lechet Shkikah and Peya, which is Doraita exempt from tithes. Now, the third ruling is going to be where Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, who says in this name of this Tana, the name of Rabbi Lazar Ben Yaakov, who says in the name of Bet Shemai that a corpse generates Tuma in the four Amos surrounding it in the public domain because of the honor. Why does that mean by the honor? Well, biblical law is saying that someone who's going to get Tuma from the corpse through contact or sharing a roof, but one who is merely just in the vicinity of a corpse does not become Tame. Now, Mara Fulda says that the rabbis were worried that when a corpse is carried through a crowded public area, members of the public might jostle the corpse or even stop the funeral procession and that would end up showing disrespect to the corpse so to prevent that they decreed that corpse tuma upon anybody who approaches within four almost of the corpse in the public domain in other words what this is saying is this is a derabanan thing but that's according to bet shemai the gemara comments and says that rabbi mana says only this last ruling was stated in the name of bet shemai the first Two decrees reflect the general consensus. And basically, 
uh, that's the the insight by the Pnei Moshe on this, which is another opinion. Rabbi Yosef, son of Rabbi Bun, says all of them were stated in the name of Bet Shemai. In other words, when Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman says this regarding this final ruling that Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov was quoting Bet Shemai, he intended to the other rulings as well. And the Gemara now is going to note commonality between Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov and the others. Rabbi Yona says also that which we learned in the Mishnah in the name of Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov regarding the heiress on an embankment is also because of the appearance of wrongdoing. Because, but it says, but it is not so. And in other words, that Rabbi Yona is pointing out, why are these three laws connected to Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov also talked about, you know, connected with the Mishnah? Why are they here? Because those that he's saying are all Rabbanon things for Mars Ein issues. And Rabbi Yona is pointing out that even the Mishnah is really not a Doraita issue, it's just a Darabanan issue. And it's because of Maris Ein. And the Gemara is going to say, what difference is there between an aris that can be harvested by a person standing on the ground or one that stands even on the embankment? In other words, there's no substantial difference between these two cases, and it's just a matter of the appearance. The Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov is ruling that if one is standing on the lower field and he's able to harvest all the fruit, the heiress is going to prohibit an area for Amos from the furthest reaches of the branches. But if one can't reach the fruit from the low ground and is only going to climb up on side of the bankman on the slope, then the heiress is going to prohibit, prohibit only the area beneath the branches. And the Gemara is pointing out that by biblical law, there's no basis for this differentiation. The prohibition of the additional four Amos is going to be a, a Darabinan thing. The, for for Mars Ein, and because the vines of the upper field can be harvested from the lower field, an observer is going to look at the two areas like one, and therefore he's going to assume that when somebody is sowing foreign seed in the lower field within four almost of the vines, he's going to be transgressing the prohibition of Kalayim, and to avoid that, the sages are making offense. That is going to be the insight by this Tana, but this decree is limited to an aris on an embankment only whose elevation could cause people to misjudge the distance between the aris and the seed, and people might perceive the person sowing in a permitted area as transgressing a law of Kaliam. So to to um, to not give this uh, appearance of impropriety, the rabbis enacted a more stringent ruling to this case. Now, the mission is stated regarding the vines planted on the embankment. So really, you know, it's interesting because we looked at Bet Hillel, right, in chapter 6, Halakha 1. Bet Hillel is saying, well, you know, we're going to measure from uh, four Amos from the the uh, the wall. And so you could have a case where you're measuring four Amos from the wall and the vines might even be draped on the trellis above you. And, you know, you could theoretically uh, fit in uh, something if you're going to be measuring according to Bet, Hill, Bet Hillel's calculation, where, where, where are you measuring from the wall? And if you're measuring from the wall for almost over, you might have where the branches are extending out over even more than that. And what Rabbi Lazar Ben Yaakov is doing is he's saying that there's actually going to be a, a case where, because of the appearance of wrongdoing, the rabbis enacted a additional fence to say that uh, this is going to be uh, forbidden. But this might actually not be the halaha because as we were looking at in chapter 6, halaha 1, the karam, this kind of aris itself might not be a vineyard deraita, it might be a vineyard derabanan. And so we don't put a fence on a fence. And so that might be why uh, this might actually not be the halaha like what the mission is saying. And uh, and that's that actually might be reflective more of like the opinion of Bet Shemai, who, as you know, we saw from these other examples, is putting effectively a fence on a fence to stop a Mars Ein issue. So the Gemara is going to get onto this next part about the embankment. And again, these are going to be vines on the ground. These are going to be there's going to be a carom. This is not an aris anymore. And says where in this mission it says if it is ten tefachim higher than the ground 
the upper row does not combine with the lower row to form the vineyard. But again, the question is, what is it? What is it referring to? So the Gemara says, what does the Mishnah mean when it says it, that it is 10 Tefahim high? Does it mean that the row is 10 Tefahim high or that the embankment is 10 Tefahim high? And there's a difference between it. If it's going to be where the row uh, between row one and row two must be at least 10 Tefahim high between these rows and they'll, they'll combine, uh, that's what it's saying. Or is it saying that there does not need to be a 10 Tefahim area between the rows as long as the embankment itself is 10 Tefahim high. So you're going you're gonna to have a difference in it. And in other words, if you're saying that it being 10 Tefahim high is going to be the row of vines and then the next row of vines, then it means that on any embankment, if one row is higher than the other, as long as there are 10 Tefahim in height between the upper row and the lower row, the two rows, it's not going to combine to form a vineyard. It's, it's going to be considered to be separate areas. So that's going to be this idea where, you know, like it's going to be treated like a wall. And a wall, we know, is going to separate between one row and another row. And what this is saying is that even a diagonal slope, if this is going to be the reading of it, can act as a separator, provided that uh, it rises 10 tefakim in four amos in lateral distance. So the distance is going to be at least four, uh, four amos between this row and that row. But it has to rise on an embankment by at least 10 tefakim. And then it's going to be like a, a, a separator. So really, when you're harvesting the field, uh, each row is going to be like its own field. It's going to be like its own area. So when you're going to look at it, if it's all going to be in one straight row, that's not actually going to be a vineyard. They're not going to combine to be a halakhic vineyard anymore. It's just individual vines. The other way to read this, where it's saying it, if it is 10 tefakim high, if if that's going to be the embankment itself, in other words, if the embankment is going to be 10 tefahim higher than the ground below, then the ground and the embankment would be like separate areas. And therefore, a row on the embankment, even one low down on the slope, if it's within 10 tefahim of the ground, it can't combine with one on the ground to form a vineyard. And it's effectively like different separate areas. Okay, so the Gemara is going to try to figure this out because it's unclear what we're talking about. The Gemara asks the question, says, if you will say that the Mishnah means that the row is 10 tefakim high, then the slope on the embankment is like the lower field. And the row planted on the slope that is less than 10 tefakim from the ground is the same as one planted on the ground, since they are not separated by 10 tefakim of height. So in this case, the row would combine with one planted on the ground and form a vineyard. But if you're going to read it the other way, and says this Gemara, if you read the mission to say that it means that the embankment is 10 tefakim high, then the slope of the embankment is like the upper field of the top of the embankment. In other words, you should you should look at it like that you have the ground level, you have the embankment as 10 tefakim high, and then on top of this uh, embankment, you have another row of vines. And accordingly, if you planted on the slope less than 10 tefakim from the ground, it's going to be the same as if you planted on top of the embankment and it can't combine with a row planted on the ground because they're located in two distinct areas. In other words, that you're, you're saying that it could be like, in some cases, that it's deemed to be a single entity. And in some cases, it's going to be deemed to be two distinct entities, two different planting areas. So the Gemara is going to try to figure this out and says they bring in a Brysa to try to help us. And it doesn't exactly match, but the Brysa says like this. It says, we learned in the Bryce regarding two rows that are planted on an embankment. So again, we've planted this on a slope, let's say in the Jerusalem Hills. It says that if it is 10 tefakim high, the rows do not combine to form a vineyard. Now, can you possibly say, you know, faced with this Bryce, that when the Mishnah says it's 10 tefakim high, that it means that the embankment is 10 tefakim high and that the row is not 10 tefakim high? Of course not. So in other words, with this Bryce's reading, it would look like a quarter to the where you have two rows anywhere on this embankment are going to be deemed to be located in a single area and it will combine. And this Barisa is actually ruling that it does not. So when it's saying that the Barisa, if it is 10 tefakim high, 
would not would refer not to the embankment but to the upper row, which is going to be ten tefakim higher on the embankment than the other row, then it would be that since there's ten tefakim height between the two rows, they don't combine. And this, why wouldn't they combine? Well, we know that if it's not going to be a vineyard, then they're individual vines if it's a row. And we know that between one and the other, that that uh, you need six tefakim between uh, this and that. You're basically left with two individual uh, rows of vines that are not vineyards, and because they're not going to combine. And if we're seeing that. Uh, it could be where this halakha is trying to tell us that depending on, on how you're going to look at it, whether one is going to be on top of this embankment and one is going to be planted alongside of the embankment, or the question is they're both on the embankment and you know one is going to be 10 tefakim higher than the other, are these going to combine? And we see them as Brysa that the different areas on the embankment are not viewed as a single entity. So it would seem like the Mishnah is referring to a row, not the embankment. That's what it looks like. But Rabbi Matt is going to reject this proof because there's something that's going to come up that we didn't necessarily consider. And Rabbi Matt says the fact that the Mishnah might very well be referring to the height of the embankment could be resolved like this. It says regarding all these 10 tefakim of the slope of the embankment, the rabbis treat them like a distinct area. In other words, independent of both the upper field and the lower field. And this Bryce is ruling that the two rows on an embankment, in other words, one is on a slope and one is at the top, so it's on flat ground, not on the slope, that they don't combine. And so it emerged that this Bryce is not offering proof that Rabbi Manna is bringing to understanding the meaning of what this mission is talking about. So we need to go back and look at what is the word it in this mission mean. The Gemara says, that we learned there in the Mishnah in Shabbos 11.3. This, by the way, is going to be in Bavli 100a. And it says, regarding one who throws an object on the Shabbos for Amos in the public domain against a wall, if it strikes the wall above 10 tefakim above the ground, it is as though he threw it in the air and he did not transgress Shabbos. But if it strikes the wall below 10 tefakim, it's like he threw it on the ground and then he transgressed Shabbos. Because, again, he basically did something uh, outside of, uh, in the public domain. He's basically uh, uh, moved something from one domain to another. And you're not allowed to move from, you know, one domain to another in the public uh, on, Shab on Shabbos. So the Gemara is going to look about this prohibition of transferring an object for Amos in the public domain. Rav Chizda says that the prohibition applies where one measures the four Amos on their diagonal. And that's going to be where the object is transferred a distance equivalent to the diagonal of a square measuring four almost by four almost. And the Gemara is going to question this Mishnah's ruling regarding the object that strikes the wall under 10 Tefakim. It says, but the object is not destined to fall on the ground. In other words, it's going to fall. And the Gemara answers, Rabbi Kiyah says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, let the Mishnah be interpreted as discussing where the object is a sticky fig cake, which sticks to the wall. And then when you throw it on, it's not going to fall to the ground. So then the thrower, uh, you know, the question is, you know, if it's above, is he liable? If it's below, is he liable? And the Gemara is resolving this question on this Mishnah. Rabbi Chagai says before Rabbi Yossi, does the Mishnah not tell us that the slope of an embankment is like that lower field? In other words, consider like this. This is the Pnei Moshe. The side of the wall is comparable to the slope of the embankment. And if the slope is viewed as a place separate and distinct from the ground below, the same must be true of the wall. So someone who throws a fig cake on the side of the wall should be liable. So it would follow that the wall is not regarded as, a, as separate from the ground, and the same would be true with regard to the slope of the embankment. But the Gemara is going to reject the, di the difference and comparison between the row of vines on a slope and then the fig that's thrown against the wall. Rabbi Yossi says to Rabbi Haggai that there, in the case of the slope, the planted row benefits from the slope, meaning that the vines are gripped firmly by the earth, which prevents it from falling to the ground below. But here, in the case of the wall, it is common for people to brush against the wall 
and to walk by it, and this fig cake is going to be dislodged, and it will fall to the ground eventually. And since this fig cake inevitably will fall to the ground, it's considered to have come to rest there. So in that case, it will eventually fall, and the thrower will be liable. But the Gemara is going to elaborate. If Rabbi Yochanan would have said that the Mishnah's case is where there's a crevice there in the wall, and then the object is thrown into this crevice and comes to rest there, and the object now is benefiting from this crevice, just as a plant would benefit from the slope, then the comparison between the wall and the slope would be fine. But the idea, says the Mara Hulda, is that Rabbi Yochanan did not interpret the Mishnah in this way. Instead, he's identifying the object thrown as a fig cake that is going to stick to the face of the wall. In other words, there's no cleft in there, and this comparison doesn't, uh, doesn't fit. So we can infer from the Mishnah that the slope of the embankment is going to be like the ground below. Rabbi Yossi's point is going to be that with Rabbi Yochanan, that the Gemara is basically wondering why the object thrown against the wall is going to be prohibited if the object is destined to fall to the ground anyway. And so Rabbi Yochanan did not offer this interpretation and was just explaining the Mishnah, talking about a fig cake. The question is, well, how does this fit in with the, uh, the embankment? So the Gemara is going to try to continue this with, a, with another, with a Tosefeta from 3.8. And the Gemara is going to say like this, regarding two garden plots, one above the other, and the lower one was made into a vineyard, and the upper one was not made into a vineyard, one may sow the upper one with foreign seed until he reaches the airspace of 10 tefakim above the ground. In other words, that you measure from the, the ground, and you go up 10 tefakim, and then you can start to plant again, even along the side of the embankment. But there's a problem with that. Rabbi Ban Barhia asks before Rabbi Zerah and says, does this Bryce not tell us that the slope of an embankment is not like the lower field? And the Gemara is going to reject this proof. Rabbi Zerah says back to Rabbi Ban Barhia that the problem is that because the foreign plants are going to lead and lean into the airspace of the vineyard, it is going to be prohibited. In other words, what we didn't consider is that some of these plants are going to end up uh, the vines are going to end up growing and perhaps leaning over some of this other species or vice versa. Maybe some of the other species are going to be planted along the slope and they're going to be growing out and they might end up going over the airspace of the, of the, of the vineyard. The slope of the embankment being at least, at least 10 tefakim high to separate it is going to be like, well, what again, what does it mean? And we're not really sure. So the Gemara is going to try to look at it again. It says that if the upper garden plot was made into a vineyard and the lower one was, was not made into a vineyard, this is the law. It says that one may sow the lower plot and then the slope above it with foreign seed until he reaches the base of the grapevines that grow in the upper area. So... In this case, the vineyard is planted in the field located at the top of the embankment, and then the foreign seed is going to be under that. And the Bryce is ruling that one may sow foreign seed along the entire slope up to the top of the embankment, uh, even if that's going to bring the foreign seed right up to the base of the vines. Why? Because the idea is that it's going to be regarded as a separate planted area, and it's going to be clear that this is a separate planting area. So the idea is like this, that on the slope of the embankment and the ground under the embankment, you have foreign seed. And on top of the embankment, you have grapes and grapevines. And so what this is saying is that you can actually plant right alongside of it. Why? Because the slope of this embankment is going to be regarded as a distinct separate area. And then the Gemara is going to clarify it. Rabbi Yossi says that the Bryce is not actually saying here that one may sow until the base of the vines, but only that he may sow below three tefakim from the base of the vines. And so above that, it's going to be forbidden. Rabbi Yossi is basically saying that if you are if you have the foreign seed along the embankment and at the ground level and the vines at the top, that from the edge of the vines, you have to measure uh, down three tefakim 
and there has to be that separation there before you can start to plant foreign seed. And Rabbi Yossi is basically saying that the, the Bryce's wording is imprecise, and the Marafulda is saying that the Bryce does not actually mean that one can, can sow on the, soap, on the slope until the very base of the vines. Really what he's saying is that you can sow the foreign seed until three tefakim below the level of the vines, but not any higher. Rabbi Yossi is going to cite a Bryce that's going to actually support his statement, and the Gemara is going to say like this, that it is as that which you taught in a brisa, the roots of matter, again, this is going to be a plant that is used for dye and it is planted underground and you only want the roots. You are only making your dye out of the roots. You don't care about what grows above it. And we know that you have to bury that at least uh, three tafahim. And, and we also know that for normal plants like herbs and grain, that the roots are going to grow up and down, straight down, it doesn't spread out to the sides. So the roots of the matter will though. And so the Gemara says that, as it was taught in this Bryce, the, root of, the roots of matter, which is going to be this plant, that enter within the four amos of a vineyard more than three tefakim below the ground are permitted. In other words, this Bryce is implying that foreign roots that grow within the three tefak area beneath the vineyard are going to be prohibited. And accordingly, one may not sow the top three tefakim of the slope because the roots will inevitably invade the three tefak area beneath the grapevines. This is talking about matter that has been planted at a depth of three tefakim alongside the four amos surrounding the vineyard and other crops sown near the four amos uh, don't need to be planted at any depth but may be sown on the surface. And the idea is that the roots are going to go straight down and they're not going to infringe on the neighboring vineyard area. But the matter, because its roots do spread out to the sides, can't be planted on the surface alongside the forearm area because the roots will go sideways under the ground and into that area. So in order to plant the matter, you have to first dig down a depth of three tefakim and then you can plant it. And the idea is that the matter roots do not begin spreading out until below the three tefach mark. So although the roots of ordinary plants are going to grow downward and not to the sides, it's nevertheless forbidden to sow the top three tefakim on the slope of the embankment within four almost of the edge, since any plants that take root there in the top three tefakim of the slope will automatically encroach on the vineyard area within the three tefakim of the surface. And that's going to be a problem. So, in other words, the idea is that it's very good that, you know, on top of this embankment, that the roots are going to go straight down. But the problem is that if you're planting matter, which have its roots that will not go straight down, and it's on the embankment, but actually will spread out to the sides, now those roots are going to go to the other roots. And... It's not going to be a case like you just planted, you know, wheat over here that also has roots going straight down, and at the top you have grapevines. We're talking about a plant that actively has roots that will spread out. And so what it's trying to say is that you have to create a distance on this embankment where the the first row of matter where you start is going to is going to start at least three tefakim lower than the embankment, so that when the roots do spread out it's going to be in a different domain and it will not connect with the roots of the other plant on top of the embankment. So there's a lot of complexity here and, you know, it does matter because, no pun intended, Jerusalem hills are hilly and there are vineyards all over the Jerusalem hills in the hills. And the question is, what happens if you have a row of vines and then you have an embankment and you have the vines at the ground level you have an embankment, and then at the top level, you have another row of vines. Did that combine to make a vineyard? It did not. And if, as long as that slope is 10 tefakim high, that's going to be considered two individual rows of vines, just a collection of vines, and it's not going to con connect to be a vineyard. But what happens if you have where the embankment itself is going to be 10 tefakim high, and one of the rows of vines is planted at the top, 
and one is going to be planted on the embankment on the slope itself, it would seem like these also do not connect. And you know, where would it uh, perhaps connect if it were on ground level and at the along the embankment and the second row is planted along the embankment? It looks like at that point it would connect, but it looks like it would not connect if the if one row is planted on the embankment and the other row is planted at the top of the embankment. It doesn't look like it would connect. Anyway, there's a lot going on here, and in Halakha 3, we're going to get into other things about the lattice work of the trellis. Have a great day.